Okay, maintenance planning. Um, it's a it's a that's a long uh, lecture here with uh, sixty pages, but we'll get through it for sure. Hopefully, before you fall, don't fall asleep. Well, you just woke up, so you shouldn't be falling asleep anyway. Is this uh, what okay, we well, normally call a preventive maintenance plan? Yeah, basically, there's a whole bunch of stuff like this. There's um, all sorts of um, uh, maintenance issues in here, or um, with planning and how we do maintenance, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so there's all sorts. If you've worked in a large plant, you understand lots of this already. I'm gonna go home. I should say slideshow from the beginning. Ah. So I'm gonna take this up this here like this. No, I don't like that. What do you guys see on there? Do you see back to two screens? Yeah, we're seeing presentation view there. Okay, let me get out of this. Um, you may share the different screen. Yeah, I was sharing a different screen, wasn't I? Okay. There we go. How, how does that look? Yeah, that's this is great. Okay. That's perfect. So, I love it. Maintenance planning. <clears throat> So learning objectives. Now this is uh, this is we were going to describe the reactive, preventive, and predictive methods of maintenance planning. Describe the key performance indicators. So we call those KPIs as it relates to reliability. Describe the equipment criticality. So we're going to put the equipment in order of its criticality, which one's more important than the other one, in a hierarchy, and criticality decisions process as it relates to maintenance planning. Describe an inventory control process. So in other words, we're going to talk about what do we have in inventory and why do we need it in inventory and can that inventory be held at the vendor or does it have to be on site for, um, for us because it's a piece of equipment that we'll need. If we lose it, we lose all of our plant production. Describe estimating justification and purchasing procedures. Again, every one of these uh, objectives has a course in its own. Um, so we're just going to be touching on all this stuff. Six, describe maintenance scheduling and, rec and record keeping. And describe management of change, MOC, process and their purpose. Um, the MOC is management of change. I think I've been talking to you guys about this before when uh, Anything that changes uh, the way you run your um, the production line, whatever you're doing, it's got and you, you change it and there's different shifts. You need a management of change as far as if you even if you, you know, are going to trim a valve or, or do something with a valve, change the valve out, whatever it is, if it's a management of change, it's got to be signed by a whole bunch of people. And we'll talk about that, too. So learning objective, describe reactive, preventive, and pre uh, predictive methods of maintenance planning. So on this chart here, uh, along here, we have the, the, the failure rate. And this is on page two. And then this is infant mortality. This means that if you get a piece of equipment in there um, and it fails right away, um, simply because it wasn't oiled or it didn't work properly or whatever, so there's this called, we call this in, infant mortality when you're, you, you've got a piece of equipment and it fails right away. This is a normal constant failure rate of a useful period of life right here. And then at the end, we have the wear out period. So this is when this, this piece of equipment is running so much that it's going to wear out. And we know that. So maintenance is the action taken to prevent equipment from failing or to repair normal equipment from degradation of wear to keep it properly working in proper working order. Three different types of maintenance. We have reactive, preventive, and predictive. Those are our three types. Um, as I say, um, when we do maintenance um, at home, 
for, for the stuff that I do, um, it's usually reactive. The ta something has to happen first before I'll do any maintenance. Now, if I'm looking at my vehicle or whatever, uh, brakes and all that kind of stuff, um, we can tell. Again, it's still reactive, but then like when our shocks go or muffler goes or something like that, that's always reactive. We don't we don't uh, replace the things that don't need to be replaced. And it's the same with companies also. So reactive maintenance, also known as breakdown maintenance. It's a method of repairing equipment once it no longer functions properly. And this could be catastrophic because it might stop a bunch of stuff. But normally, um, we know a lot of companies that just do reactive maintenance. When something breaks down, then they go fix it. So it's not used on critical equipment because if it was, um, and you just reacted to that critical equipment, that critical equipment could shut your plant down. And I know you guys have seen it where they just do reactive maintenance. Preventive maintenance, that means we uh, service equipment on a runtime basis, whether it needs it or not. Um, typical example here for, is an oil change. Every 10,000, 20,000 clicks, we do an oil change or something like that, right? So that's prevent, uh, preventive maintenance. So the advantage of preventive maintenance extends the useful life of equipment, results in better efficiencies, uh, prevents costs to repair, because uh, if you get catastrophic failures uh, because you didn't do preventive maintenance, uh, most of the time they become more costly. Reduces the number of failures, reduces the amount of on-hand inventory, and allows time for job preparation. That's what we call preventative maintenance. So limited uh, limitations or unnecessary maintenance. I know that I've uh, we've gone I've gone into uh, marshaling cabinets and things like that, and I've gone into tighten all um, tighten all the wires in there. And I know that you do this all the time, like every three months or whatever. Pretty soon your 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 screws fail and all that kind of stuff. So you know, unnecessary maintenance sometimes causes damage too. So it says damage to components may occur during unnecessary maintenance. Releases of catastrophic failures can occur should equipment fail before it's scheduled maintenance. Predictive maintenance. So this takes uh, the measure and analysis variables to predict the wear rate of expected repair schedule for equipment. So uh, the advantage of this extends a useful life of equipment, results in better efficiencies, prevents cost of repairs, reduces number of failures, reduces the amount of on-hand inventory, and allows time for job preparation and planning. So with predictive maintenance, it, it uh, eliminates unnecessary maintenance, uh, reduces possibility of release or failure, and eliminates potential for incidental damage or, or during net unnecessary maintenance. So I don't, I don't know a lot of places that actually do per, per maintenance. Uh, mostly we just do your, mostly this is preventive maintenance to do PMs. All right, learning objective two, describe the key performance indicators. Now, when we talk about key performance indicators, we're talking about how our process or how our system is working. And it says here, key performance indicators as it relates to reliability. How reliable is our plant? So key performance indicators measure is process of collecting and analyzing and reporting information about the performance of the system. Key performance indicators are used to identify where we need to take action to improve performance. And the, the asset reliability process has three parts. All have KPIs associated, associated um, to evaluate its success. And we're talking about the business plan and we're talking about the maintenance and we're talking about the quality improvement. So those are the three assets so the business maintenance work needs to support the business goals and the reliability strategy of the company and here's a chart and this is on page 13 um, it talks about percentage of emergency work that's my a key performance indicator um, we, we measure on effectiveness and it's less than 10 percent 
So that's our target value for emergency work is less than 10%. Uh, if we look at uh, the, the mean time between failures, so that's the time between failures, how effective is that? Um, so if it's increasing uh, and it's greater than 10% a year, this one here says maintenance costs as percentage of total sales. So we measure the cost and it should be six to eight percent. So this is just giving us guidelines like a, of our business plan. Uh, here we got maintenance costs. And here again, the measuring um, part of it is how much does it cost? And then it's two to three percent. Um, plan uh, percentage of planned work. So that's measured measurement is reliability. How reliable is my plant? And then, or, or my, my equipment greater than 85% and then unit percentage of time per year. Again, it's uh, measured on reliability and it's greater than 90%. So maintenance KPIs need to be measured uh, what maintenance does and must be controlled by the worker. So if you have a KPI for maintenance, it's planning percentage of work orders. Well, here we go into the work order. So if I'm given a work order um, with all field uh, um, fields completed, labor estimates within 10% and delays due to, uh, due to the need for materials. And then of course, they have to have, to have scheduling, percentage of scheduled available work hours, total work hours available, and that's between our employees. We, we delay work orders because of unavailable workers, equipment or space or services. And then execution, percentage of work orders completed before the required date, percentage of rework, percentage of work orders turned in with all the data fields completed. So those are maintenance KPIs. And then of course we always follow up number of work orders reviewed and closed within a given number of days. Yes, go ahead. How do we determine the efficiency for the repairing or maintenance based on the work order? Uh, well, what we do is we, if we, if I'm given a work order and um, I can't get it done because of things like I don't have the materials, or I didn't have the, enough people to help me out, all that kind of stuff, right? So then we schedule that um, and then we can figure out um, when most of our workers are on site, things like that. And then of course execution is if it's done. If we get that, if we get that work order done. And then of course the follow-up, just to review the work orders received. So when you're planning the total hours per job, is mm -hmm. that just based on your experience? Or is uh well, some number you know won't come from any books? <laughs> yeah, it certainly won't come from any books. Uh normally when they do this. Um, I've worked at uh, Suncor. They just give us plenty of time to get it done uh, because there's things like when we go get a, um, we need we need a work order and then we need a permit. So I've sat in the permit office for for four hours, right? So you're right. This doesn't come from any book. This just comes from practical experience from your supervisor, things like that. So as a planner, they, they just uh, listen to your voice and uh, you give a, uh... A predicted hours and they just put in the work order yeah pretty much um you know what the unless uh, the, depending on if it's critical or not they may uh, they may um put more workers than needed on the job if if this this needs to be done things like that right you can put extra guys on it or uh, you know extra time or the big word overtime a lot of times we'll, we'll work overtime until it's done, depending on the severity of it, right? Depending on what it needs. But this is all through experience for sure. Yeah. So quality improvement, assessment of KPIs to see if they meet their targets. So here's work identification, defines the maintenance tasks required to achieve the performance level required. Percentage of work available uh, hours used for proactive work. And then of course you get your performance analysis. And this is all again, this is all 
done on past experience. They know how long it should take. Like if you go into, uh, if you say, for example, you go into um, an auto service station, every one of their jobs is listed and it's listed for the hours, what they need, all that kind of stuff. And that's under normal circumstances. If you got a, a sheared bolt or a cross threads, or you have to do more than things just happen to, you know, take more time and all that kind of stuff. But when we do a performance analysis, evaluates the maintenance effectiveness by focus on the, the maintenance KPIs, key performance indicators. Number of re, uh, reliable imp uh, improvement actions initiated through performance analysis. And number of asset reliable actions resolved. So again, like you said, Michael, this isn't out of any book. Um, they're going to tell you how long it should take. Uh, sometimes it, it takes less time. Sometimes it takes more time to do a particular job. Because we, all, we always find a run into snags. Equipment criticality, what's equipment is the most important to us? A decision that uses risk calculation to identify the impact of the equipment failure. Equipment criticality consists of the following three steps. It's got a uh, risk matrix, the hierarchy of the equipment that we're going to be using, and an analysis. So when you talk about a risk uh, matrix, equipment criticality uh, rates equipment in hierarchy. And the risk matrix uses three common methods, the cost of the equipment, the, uh, the relative risk, the criticality number. So those three things are my, in my, my risk matrix. And that's where I'll, I'll put my uh, equipment in, in a hierarchy. A hierarchy means which one, which piece of equipment is more important. So the cost consequences, cost loss to production, plus the cost of repair, we have to uh, use that. Failure frequency, the failure rate of the equipment determined from maintenance history. And our little formula here, we talk about equipment criticality is equal to failure, and this is per year, times cost. So if I've got equipment that's failing uh, um, all the time, so my uh, frequency failure goes up, so does my costs. So that will be determined for my equipment criticality. Relative risk, frequency is typical number between one and 10. It is determined from the table using frequency descriptions. So I've got this, this um, table that I'll show you here, and it talks about uh, frequency is typical number between one and 10. So the total consequence is a summation of all the values assigned to a specific consequence, consequence areas. So relative risk, looking at here, equal failure frequency times total consequence. So here's my consequence area. So I get safety, I got environment, I get quality, got throughput, customer service and operating costs. And I use this scale. I use this scale here uh, for safety at zero to 40. Uh, zero means no release, no severe damage and safety. This is environmental, no, in, oh, this actually, these should be changed. Uh, no injury is zero, multiple fatalities is 40. That should be up in the safety. This should be down here. Just notice that. Anyway, quality, uh, no effect on production is zero. Total loss of production is 10. Uh, throughput, which is what I'm putting through my plant, no loss of production is zero, unrecoverable loss is 10. So here's my one to 10, my frequency, and given the numbers. And operating costs here, no increase in costs and high cost increase. So when I look at this, I take my relative risk as equal to failure frequency times cost consequences. So these are the cost consequences and of safety, environment, quality, throughput. Critical number, criticality number. Equipment criticality number is between one and nine in the, uh, indicated 
the impact of failure. So here's another one. Uh, we have a, a table on page 17 and 18, critical consequences rating. So if it's safety or environment and it's uh, greater than or equal to 38, it's a nine. So they're just given these arbitrary numbers from nine all the way to one and basically go through all of these. And if my total consequence is less than four, it's a one. So all they're doing is, is, is giving these a number so that means something to somebody. A criticality hierarchy organizes the equipment in order of importance. So here's a, on page 18, we've got a boiler. So this is this, uh, the asset is the boiler. Then we got feed water and the control valve. And then we have these that are about the control valve. So I've got the body, the actuator positioner. Um, so the hierarchy is the boiler itself. That's the most important. And then the feed water control valve. And then of course, in the, in the control valve, we have the body, the actuator and the positioner. So this is a hierarchy and that's criticality hierarchy. And of course, they'll give it a number also. In this case, criticality is a boiler is six and the actual control valve is four. So that means something to somebody when these reports. Equipment criticality um, analysis helps determine plant priorities. So possible uses that include priority of determining the maintenance task, optimize spare parts inventory, so in this case, if we look at the back and we're looking at this valve and we have this actuator that keeps going or something like that, we want to have this actuator on site. And then to focus reliability improvements on most critical equipment. Describe the in inventory control process. So as you know, when um, it's always nice to walk into the shop and have uh, a bolt bin and have uh, basically, you know, you can have transmitters or whatever you, you use lots of. It's nice to have it there because if you don't have it uh, at, in your shop, then you have to order it and nobody knows, nobody can really determine what, how, how it's going to get there or how fast it's going to get there. So inventory control is, is huge. And a lot of plants. What are we going to? What are we going to store? What are we going to put in? Um, you know, in a warehouse, things like that. And if you put too much in there, then it's costly. So inventory. So maintenance, repair, and operations inventory. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a proper number for the inventory based on the plant size or equipment uh, list? Uh, any percentage numbers to to be ideal? Um, you want to read, yeah. Well, want. and again, this this is if I go to this page here, um, with inventory control process, if it's critical, you would have more than one. But there is no given set numbers. If it's and we'll, we'll, as we go through this, we'll know that um, different type of of, of um, inventory that we have, like nuts and bolts. Um, and we, we describe that, but if, if there's something that's in critical for your plant, uh, you better have one. Um, and there's no, nothing set in stone of how many you should have, but it's just, uh, however, uh, it costs and, and what everybody feels safe with kind of thing at your plant. So there's no set number given. So. Maintenance, repair, and operations inventory consists of supplies that are required to ensure the continuous operation of the plant. So this is this is where you need this plant to be running. And so in your warehouse, you're going to store parts and pieces and equipment and all that kind of stuff. So three main reasons for inventory. Offset time it takes to get the stock through the supply chain. So if it's something critical, you better have it on site because if it takes, if it takes, uh, you know, weeks to get it through a supply chain, then you're in trouble. That that uh, process is going to be down. Offset the uncertainty of the market with a buffer, and purchase fast-moving items in bulk. Um, so in this case here, when I'm got when I'm when I'm using uh, items that 
that are like in my bolts, nuts, bolts, anything like that. You purchase them in bulk and then you, you put them in your shop. Inventory consists of the following product types. And this is where this is what we'll talk about and I break them down. You have consumables. That means the things you're going to use all the time, tie wraps and screws and uh, whatever we're going to be using day to day stuff, right? They're called consumables, open issue items and repair spares. And I'll go through each one of these just so that we recognize what they're, what they're, what they are. Capital spares. Those are the big items that uh, need to be, uh, they're costly but they're important. So consumables, so item used during production process. So here for instrumentation, we got like calibration gas is a consumable, filters for sampling systems, lights, protective gloves, all your PPE and stuff like that are all considered consumables. Open issues are small do dollar items, um, stocked by carton or multiple packs such as nuts and bolts. Repair spares, used to fix production equipment and replace original pieces of equipment. So they talk about bearings and belts and sensors. So those repair spares. And the last one is critical uh, uh, capital spares. Now these capital spares are big ticket items that cost money. So capital spares exceed a certain dollar value determined by management and are stocked in order to avoid lost production because of major mechanical failure with critical piece of equipment. So those are what I call our capital spares. Your inventory control, a record system that tracks the amount of stock keeping units, SKU. And you guys have seen the SKU, to SKU, on hand or order where they are located in your warehouse. So we had a lot of stuff at, at Suncor that was in a warehouse, not just in our shop with nuts and bolts and, you know, things like that, uh, PPE. So when we order them, we just, we just um, order them from the warehouse and the warehouse delivers it. A lot of times there, um, we have to actually go and have a look to see exactly what that piece of equipment is so that it will fit in our situation. So we always went over the, to the uh, warehouse and had a look and make sure that it was what we wanted. The six rights or goals is to have the right part in the right place at the right quantity at the right time at the right price using the right strategy. Oh, that's a, that's a mouthful right there. So here's our six rights of inventory management. The part, the place, the quantity, the time, the price, and the strategy. So this is on page 22. So this right here will tell you when it should be. In, well, this is this is what the uh, actual warehouse uses. So that part has to be there for us when we need it. So six rights of goals: right part in the right place, at the right quantity, at the right time, the right price, using a right strategy, and. If that was if that was all true, we'd have no issues. But we know that if we go to the warehouse, we, a lot of times they don't have that stock to what we're looking for. On-site inventory, classifying your inventory provides a method for identifying the importance of different items related to their inventory. Three typical classifications used by inventory systems are class A, high priority, class B, medium usage, and class C, lower uses. So, and these ones here, class A, these guys are in the warehouse. They have to be in the warehouse. So management ensures these are uh, these items that we need, class A, are available. B, purchase on a regular intervals. And then C, when stock runs out, then we replace. So these are on-site inventory classifications. The vendor owns the spare parts inventory and guarantees availability. So users do not have to make capital outlays and spares. Uh, we always have these uh, suppliers, right? So all our supplier, we, the guys that purchase things um, know the suppliers, uh, if they're reliable, if they have a lot of stock, 
So a lot of times the, the vendor actually keeps the inventory for a company. Um, of course, they do that at a price. But if we know that a vendor has, uh, say, a transmitter and they've got 10 on their shelves, we know that we can go to that vendor and he'll have that inventory and we won't have to stock it. The other thing about that too is that uh, newer versions and upwares uh, um, are are there. If we store, say, a transmitter for, for a year or something like that, well, it may not have the upgraded system that it needs to run. But if we leave it for the vendor, then we're, we're always replacing with brand new, latest and greatest. So a vendor parts management program ensures lower capital costs for users when they do away with a need of their own to own and manage spare parts. Um, when we talk about this and we talk about a warehouse, um, if we don't need to put a, a piece of equipment in our warehouse, but but have it stocked at the vendors, uh, it costs less for us because we don't need the space. And then this is warranty. If you've got a warranty, it begins only when the part is used, not when it's placed in the inventory. So if I've got a piece of equipment, if I got a transmitter sitting in my on my shelf for a year and it hasn't been used, well, my warranty doesn't start until I, I uh, install it. So to describe estimating justification and purchasing procedures, this is a job in itself. Um, I've seen it I've done it or whatever, but I don't manage, when I was at Suncor, I wasn't managing the amount of money that we had as far as equipment to buy and and replacing and all that kind of stuff. But there was some people that that's their, their sole job is to, when you have project management, um, your sole job is to maintaining materials and labor costs, all that kind of stuff. We didn't care, we were just workers. So project management is process of managing and, uh, and directing time, materials, labor, and cost to complete a project in an orderly and economic manner. So we have estimating justification, purchasing procedures, our, our project management processes used to obtain equipment or to determine the scope of the project. This was way out of my scope. So estimates also, the estimate is calculated approximation of the job, time estimates. These are important, how long does it take? And these time estimates are done uh, through experience, basically. So approximate time, how long it takes for a job to be complete. The cost estimates are labor costs. The flat rate is based on history of job completion. Again, most of the stuff is based on history. Labor cost from scratch equals two times hourly rate times time. And capital cost is cost of the equipment. Indirect costs, cranes, trucks, special tools, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that we rent or contract out is indirect costs. Those can be huge. How many times have you seen a crane just sit there on your, on your job site? Um, my boss said there, those guys are eating our lunch because <laughs> basically they cost a lot just to sit there. Justification. So your justification explains why an organization needs to implement and uh, a proposed project by describing the problem and opportunity. The problem description of an issue, reason why the problem exists, what causes the problem, impact on business and, and time frames to resolve. So you and I, as when we're out there working, um, we always run across this here where I have justification of buying a new piece of equipment because it's not working or it could be done better. Um, a lot of times these guys get uh, information from us when we take it back to them and say, look, we need to do this. We need to fix this. We need to maybe replace that. And a lot of it comes from the workers like you and I. Opportunity, summary, supportive evidence, time frame, and impact on the business helps justification and build a business case. So outlines the total cost ownership and expected return of investment. 
which is called the ROI, return on investment, should indicate financial justification for doing a project. So if you build a billion dollar project that saves a million dollars, well, your return on investment isn't there. So you wouldn't be doing it. Purchasing, um, select a supplier, obtain a quote and follow the purchasing procedures. Uh, it was funny because when, when we were purchasing at Suncor, we just bought. When I purchased at the wastewater treatment plant, which was uh, um, municipality, I had to go for the I had to go for three quotes. I had to get the lowest quote, um, and doing that takes a lot of time. So when I was at Suncor, the money wasn't an issue, but when I was working for the city, it was. So I had I had to attain three quotes from different suppliers, and sometimes there aren't different suppliers for particular equipment. So we could only get one, and then we'd have to justify why we picked that. Selecting a supplier, the following must be considered. So, uh, sourcing, sole, multiple, or single. So sole sourcing means you use only one company or, or one vendor. Multiple or single, it's whoever's got it. You can call and say, hey, have you got this part? Have you got this part? If you got a sole supplier, these sole suppliers usually know what type of equipment you have and usually put a, uh, have it in stock for us. This is a big one for me, technical ability. Can they make or support the product? Uh, when you're on, on night shifts and something breaks down and you need technical ability and you need to phone somebody, that's who got my business. If I could phone that person and say, hey, I've got an issue, they either come to the plant or they, or they uh, give you uh, information on the phone. Uh, I've had situations where I'd phone and I'd get no answer, so not until the next day. So I wouldn't be buying from that supplier. So manufacturability, quality and uh, quantities. Again, reliability, uh, reliable, reputable and stable. Those are huge. After sales service, you got technical support and they got lots of inventory. So this is how you'd be selecting your supplier. Location, is it close? Or is it down, uh, is it in Calgary or is it in Edmonton? Or is it Red Deer? Is it close to your plant? And then of course, all the equipment that's the, and, and everybody knows this, we have to have a CSA approval uh, before we, we put it in our plant. Obtaining a quote, a price quote is usually a guaranteed purchase price. If the price varies, the quote will define why. And a lot of times the price will vary because of shipping. Um, even even at, at uh, Red Deer College, if I'm buying something, I have to make sure that I have the price for shipping in there, which sometimes is a pain in the butt. Sometimes it's free shipping, sometimes it's an extra cost. So the price quote should contain a price in Canadian money, delivery time, weight of delivery, physical dimensions, shipping costs, locations or recommendations, spare parts, delivery time, parts expected cost to maintain so this is all what we have to do when we um, have to obtain a quote a firm quote price is uh is time bound often in 30 days you'll always see that on a quote from emerson or spartan they'll say for 30 days because th things may change in 30 days for as far as prices purchasing procedures purchase a piece of equipment typically involves the following items a requisition, a purchase order, back orders if there is any, if they don't have it in stock, and delivery slips. We have a shipping receiving department that takes care of all of this. And they make sure that we have it all done before they even start the process. And then invoice. Requisition includes a name, date, number, of quantity, price, supplier and requisition number, firm quote can be attached to the requisition. And this is on page 32 and you can look at that. All it is is just a requisition and it has all the information needed. Purchase order, when we buy something, the purchase department completes the purchase order, which is official order number ref, uh, ref, um, referenced throughout the rest of the purchasing process. 
and is legal offer to purchase. Back orders if the supplier doesn't have a part in stock and that's huge for us because if we need it and it's on back order, who knows how long it'll take to get there. Delivery slip or package slip details the contents of the package. So that'll be taped onto the, the box or whatever the package is. Used a very, um, a very part count should be signed and dated and sent to the purchasing department. And there's just the receipt of delivery initial report, detailed report of your delivery. It's a pain in the butt, but the finance department has to have it. Invoice, invoice request for payment. The purchasing department reconciles the delivery slip to the invoice and approves payment. Okay, next learning objective, describe maintenance scheduling and, re and the record keeping. So these um, companies use computers to control maintenance and scheduling and record keeping with a computerized maintenance management system. Now, we, we put this into an acronym of CMMS, but there's so many out there, these maintenance management programs, um, and they always change. So scheduling is a method to ensure the right people and the right material at the right place, at the right time and the right amount in sequence and in right position or condition to minimize production costs. So in other words, if I've got a maintenance schedule, I've got the parts, the pieces, the time, the, you know, I've got everything written down. Well, and it's on a computer. So resources after determining the scope of the job, the methods to be used, a resource list is required, identify the manpower, equipment, tools, parts necessary to complete the job. Manpower number of workers required, equipment and tools, identify special tools required, and parts must be inventory before the job can begin. We don't start a job without parts. Now this here is called the Gantt chart and it labor sequencing is required for uh, efficient job completion and may use a Gantt chart or arrow diagram. So this will be a Gantt chart. It talks about the date here. If I look at this, it even talks at the time of day. Um, this is an instrumentation one where we're taking apart um, a valve here, FV101, all this kind of stuff. And then it gives you full sequence throughout the days, throughout the hours, and everything is done until the job's complete. You'll see these lots on the Gantt charts on shutdowns. And it's just a perfect way for these guys to, here's the work order. And then all the, just basically through the time, through the day and night, it goes through here uh, until the job's complete. And it talks about all the hoists we need and talks about everything right in here. And that's a Gantt chart. You'll see those um, in big plants or even small plants. They'll use some sort of computer operated program to uh, give you a chart. This one here is, um, this is called an arrow chart. So um, this is page 39, I believe. It's got job one and, and, and it, these all will be detailed, like job one will be detailed uh, and then job two and two and three can be done at the same time. And then when these are finished, then I can go to four and when these finish, I can go to six. When two's finished, I can go to five, basically. So they're just they're just a, another type of chart. And each one of these numbers would have a list of things that we need, like material, <clears throat> outside material, cranes, anything like that. I've never seen this. The one that I've seen is this Gantt chart. It's the same thing. Record keeping, computerized maintenance management system can be programmed to provide the following work orders, tracking, storing, and costs. And then of course our inventory. If we use all our inventory, we need it to be uh, re replaced. And then an analysis, analysis uh, the maintenance history to identify repeated problems or fix root causes. So if there's something wrong in all of this along the way, 
uh, the tracking, the storing, the cost, anything like that. We analyze it and we say we could do better if we did this or if we did that. But again, this is all on a computerized maintenance management system, whichever one you have. The last one is managing the change process and their purpose. So effective management of change is a five-step process that is a foundation of all safety and accident prevention programs. So initial request, a problem is identified. You have a detailed evaluation of the problem. And here is a team of experts. That could be two or three guys that are working on a project. Could be instrument techs, could be anybody. And then approval. So before we approve this management of change, it must be approved and accepted by plant management. And implementation, once a change is approved, all stakeholders must be informed and engineering document updated. And follow up, once the change has been implemented, there should be a follow up to ensure all precautions, preparation documents were completed correctly. So, reactive maintenance waits for breakdowns, preventive is based on runtime, and predictive maintenance uses measurement and analysis. APIs are used to identify where to take action for improvement in business, maintenance, and quality improvement. You got equipment criticality, uses risk calculations to identify the impact of the equipment failure. You got inventory is about having the right part in the right place, the right quantity, the right time, and the right price. And estimating, we do the estimating justification and purchasing procedures or on a project. And then we take we determine the scope of the project. And scheduling, ensures the right people and material at the right place, the right time, the right amount again. And effective management of change is this five-step process that is the foundation of all safety and accident prevention programs. So that, in a nutshell, is the end of maintenance planning. It is a fairly lengthy ILM, but you've probably seen a lot of this stuff, or hey, if you haven't, now you maybe can understand why these people are doing this stuff, but it is done for safe maintenance. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to end the show. I'm going to stop recording.